something that you can make on your highest slot or highest needle count cylinder that can work on all of your machines to cast on with the CSM world. So what am I saying? I have, for example, this here, this bit of flat fabric made on a 96 cylinder or 96 slot, which is what you're seeing here. Um, what I've done is I've done basically a hung hem with the Pico edge, hung the split rings, and then continued working up the piece until I got the opposite end. So this is just basically a rectangle where in this example in my hand, this is the most useful tool out there to use on your machine because this has two ends. So you could use this one and if you should screw up, your dog should get it or I don't know, whatever, get it caught in a door and one end is just not working for you and you didn't want to sew it, you could simply use the opposite end. Most of the cast on bonnets I've been giving away and or selling, they have one end because it's just easier for me. It just takes less time. Not that it takes a lot of time to make the double ended, but if you're gonna make one yourself, choose what you prefer. I've seen some people make one end with the split rings for the cast on and one end with different bigger rings in which to hang stuff off. You know what, free license, do whatever you want, whatever works. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make this fabric today hopefully speedily, economically on time, and all those words that mean awesome and quick because I have uh, less than an hour in which I have to run off to work. So here we go. If you're gonna make something like this, just don't start with crap yarn. Use good stuff. And what I mean by good stuff is make something that makes your heart happy. If you use crummy stuff for your tool that you're gonna use every day, wouldn't you wanna use something that makes you smile? Um, the other thing that's probably more important is use a fiber that is strong. Don't use grandma's old attic fiber that's fallen apart when you touch it. Use something that's got some sturdiness to it. It doesn't have to be anything really specific, just something that's got some strength. So I, um, what you're seeing here on the machine is I have already cast on with uh, a project that I'm making a couple versions of for an upcoming event in 219 September. Um, but anyways, what I thought I'd do is quickly make a video to help you figure out how I'm making these. Now this is not a new technique, the idea of working flat on a CSM. This is actually a um, an idea that's been um, introduced eons ago in the older manuals that speak gobbledygook in my opinion, but uh, yeah. Um, so let's get forward and stop babbling on and just get you going. How about that? So I want, what I want you to do is start on your machine with whatever cast on that you have, cast on startup device or anything that just gets you to this point. Uh, you can choose to work in the round on your scrap. Um, you can do whatever you want, really. If you work flat on your scrap, then it just means that when you have it off the machine and you are doing your sewn bind off with that last edge, it just means your material is easier to play with because it's flat versus, oh, it's round. Really not a big thing. If you have worked in the round on your scrap and it's off the machine and you're like, oh, darn, it's round. I mean, really not hard. Cut it at the join because that's scrap. You can cut that stuff. You're probably gonna throw it away. And you can easily then do your uh, finishing techniques. Okay, so if you haven't already gotten to this point, pause the video, go ahead, cast your biggest cylinder, make sure your needle's working, that all your alignment is there. You do not, have, do not need to rib or mock rib or anything rib in regards to this project. So pause now and there you are. All right, so if that is where you are now, as you can see, you are ready. All right, so things to note with what we're looking at in regards to this technique. Whenever you do anything on this project, you do it at six o'clock. Now my machine, of course, might have a different setup than your machine. I like to be dead on so that the crank goes this way and that makes six o'clock, three, nine and 12, if I know what a clock looks like. Anyways, so as you can tell, I have my cylinder marked at 12. Everything that's a seam or separation is always gonna happen at 12. Any movement 
uh, in regards to the next steps will always happen at six. So don't worry if you're not yet here. Get yourself cast on. Get yourself so that you're either at six o'clock and if you're at six o'clock now and you should be at six o'clock now, disregard what you're looking at. Um, then I want it, what I want you to do then is at six o'clock now, raise your 12 o'clock left side of the 12 o'clock mark all the way to nine or a little bit further past, maybe closer to seven. Raise all these guys. Why are we raising that now at six o'clock where your yarn carry is? Pretend you don't see that. You're at six o'clock because at this point, preparing preparing to come around here, whoa, bumpers. If these are up, then you're not gonna accidentally knit them. So what you wanna do is you're stopped at six with your scrap and what you wanna do is prepare those, the other wall of the needle, so on the other side, put those up. You're stopped at six. Now your next step is going to be to switch to your good yarn once you reach this part here. So you are stopped at six o'clock. You've raised these guys. Great. And what you're gonna do now is just have your good yarn ready, all right? And so then you're gonna keep going, knit all the way over, and then continue and put your carrier at nine. So I'm gonna assume that's where you are because I'm talking to myself and the two cats that are about to jump on the video camera. Don't do that, come on, come on. Sorry. Um, anyhow, so we have finished our row of the scrap. The scrap is there. It goes up to the machine. So now we're gonna to switch to the good yarn. So in regards to the good yarn, once again, pick something that makes your heart happy. If you're thinking, hey, you know what? This is example time. This is my scrap. This is my test. You know, do whatever works for you. You can switch your yarn anywhere you want, but do finish the scrap row to this point as indicated here. So take your scrap yarn off. Now you might ask what the flip were you looking at for pink? This is just a wonderfully, whoops, donated to me from Susan Forsyth in Mission. She's awesome, she's a refurbisher, and I keep tangling on the machine, don't do that. Um, this is just some kind of acrylic, that's just the right kind of fiber weight, closest to sock yarn, so less problems whenever I use anything else. So what we're looking at here is, um, in the background, it's a purple cotton, with the project that I'm using, I'm actually using two yarns, um, both this one here, which you can't fully see just yet, is something I got from a fabric kind of basic store downtown Vancouver. Um, it's from Dresso. It doesn't really matter what it is, but for my fiber project today, I'm using a combination of two yarns that I'm going to feed up. Let's see, this would be organized if I did this ahead of time, but you know, whatever. It's always harder when you've got the video rolling. So I'm just going to feed my two yarns into my yarn mask, the topper. Come down through my fancy pants light because these things are awesome. And I have recently upgraded my light. Yeah. All right. Well, we're coming through there. So as you would whenever you're changing to a good yarn, is finish the last row to the edge that you would start a new one. I keep jumping that, sorry. Um, what I like to do, at least in this example, you're gonna find there's 5,000 ways to do everything. It's okay, do it your way. Change your yarn. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to lay the tail, start there, come on over to the yarn carrier, which is at nine thereabouts. Fish the bad guy up on the yarn carrier. Now, some people hold things, some people clamp things. You can do whatever works for you. And as soon as I find my, oh, there it is, inside the machine, of course. So what I've gotten most recently into is just using this, it's called a hummingbird um, hemostat. It's three and a half inches. Um, it requires less work than anything that I've used, so I like it, and I'm going to use that. So instead of securing it with knots and clips, I'm going to use this style of clip. So what I'm going to do first is just connect the tail I've just added to the scrap that is there, 
and just kind of pinch it. Kind of like I had knotted it. There you are. And I'm going to put the finger parts down into the machine. All right, good. Hopefully you can see that. Um, now I found kind of like a heel. If you're starting something right there, engage your heel spring here so you don't forget. Because I am pinched here, it won't come undone. So awesome. Um, all right. So if I just started here, this first stitch isn't going to really knit. Not really. So maybe it's overkill. Who knows? I prefer to kind of go on the second a needle. I like to kind of bit an e-wrap just on that one and I feel it kind of extra secures this first row so on the needle here the second one in I've taken the yarn behind the needle and just kind of wrapped it in and down so that's basically the path there and then snug it up good heel spring engaged all right so the plan here Basically, there are two edge styles of this project. You are making something flat. The parts where you're going to have a hung hem, um, which you're basically going to have a hung hem on both ends. Uh, I've always not done the special edge. I've just done a regular edge. What am I talking about? When you look at the regular fabric, you have a cleaner, although less fancy, edge if you just do a regular knit. Now, you don't know what the other one is yet, but now I'll tell you. The other edge is this kind of beautiful, it's kind of a slip stitch edge, I've heard it referred to as, and it's just kind of a nice way. It kind of still curls a little bit, and of course I haven't ironed this to beans just a little bit. It doesn't really need to stay flat, but um, it looks a little bit nicer. So we're gonna do a different edge for the main body than we are for the hang hem. This will be clearer once you see the full picture, but in the meantime, that's where we're at. So what does that mean? That means right now, we're gonna continue on the hung hem sections of this project, not doing a fancy edge. So that's all that really means. Now that won't matter to you now, cause you know, we're just getting into the instructions, but it'll make more sense later. All right, so we're ready to start our first row using the um, sock yarn. We don't care about row numbers because this style of row counter that we have from Awesome Dave Lord does full rotations. And of course, you're not doing full rotations. You're kind of going there and going back and then going there and going back. So don't worry about that because honestly, in regards to uh, number of rows made, you really don't need to do number of rows made. You need to approximately do the same for your hung ham in on the inside and on the outside, and then just do the project length that'll be reachable underneath the machine. So you'll make a project, or if you want to make what I'm making in the way I'm making it, of course, when you are knitting your fabric, you're gonna make it to about at least the distance or length down to your crank wheel. So I like to go at least until about maybe couple fingers underneath the crank wheel with the weight on it because when the weight is on it it's longer of course and when it's more relaxed it'll be shorter you just want to have enough space to put your your uh, buckle and your weights which I already have on machine so hopefully you do too now some people believe in holding their work when they are working and if that's how you work that's perfectly fine personally I like to use the weight because the weight is consistent it doesn't change it is what it is. So if I start pulling, I might pull more, I might pull less, I might pull to the left, to the right, whatever. So that's what I believe. But you don't have to do what I do, just do whatever works for you. All right, let's start. I'm sorry, I'm such a Gabby today. All right, so you're always gonna check to make sure all of your latches are open because they're sneaky little guys and they will. I'm gonna keep bumping this, I know I am. Um, they are going to close when you least expect it. So don't go like a speed demon, but there we go. So we're always going to go to six o'clock. So we're at six thereabouts. At six o'clock, we always switch. So on the right hand side of 12, two about three, if not two about four. Everything on the left is open. Take that out of there. There we go. 
Now I'm working on a Laguerre 400. Um, you certainly can, as I understand it, do this on any machine out there that can go reverse, even just for heels. Uh, my machine can go in any direction, regardless of uh, needles up, needles down. But I believe the open cam, which is not what this is, this is a closed cam, but the open cam machines, machines require a certain number of needles to be up to you kind of clear that last click before you can kind of go in reverse. So, you know what? You can t put as many needles as you want up if you have to, to go in reverse. Just of course, note the ones that go up are the ones you don't want to knit. So, if you have to put this many and or more to simply knit over there, that's okay, do what works for you. All right, so at six o'clock, we've raised the right, we've confirmed the latches on the left are all open, and we'll go across. So as you can see, now that we've done basically one complete row, this is how you can work the rows without um, infringing or extra knitting on the reverse side of the shore here. So we've basically done a row, started on this side of 12, worked across, and stopped here. So this is our basic edge that we're going to continue on our hung ham, which is what this plan is. We're working from the bottom up. So we're going to come back now and just make sure we're at six there, whoop, thereabouts. We are going to raise the left side of 12. So you can use your tool, you can use your crescent, use whatever works for you. I found, um, honestly, I like to use my fingers a lot. I've been poked a lot. They are sharp. Be careful. And just keep working it there. You're going to find, um, you will feel when something is not going, um, when something drops, you will actually feel it. If you're not going like a speed demon, you will know and you will stop if your eyeballs haven't spotted it. All right, so everything open on the left. So we're just going to continue. So as you can see, I'm not doing anything special to the edges. I'm just kind of going back and forth. So do what works for you. You don't have to do exactly at six. It's really not that precise. Just don't wait till 12 to try to lift the stitches that'll be trapped by the cam. It's pretty straightforward. So here I am. I'm just going to zippity-boo here. You can get into a bit, a bit of a rhythm. Sorry for all the bumping. I think I will do um, at least maybe 11, 12 rows. Ouch, that poked me. Before uh, we hang the hem to make a nice bottom edge. I like to have a hung hem on the bottom beyond just having a knitted, uh, rather a ribbed kind of segment because it's a bit thicker and it's a little bit, oh, there we go, a little bit um, easier for the weight, buckle to stay put when there has that thickness fabric there. So I don't know if you saw that there. Um, I hadn't gone all the way to nine and that meant my needles hadn't gone all the way down to go back up. And then when I went to come back, they were on their way down and I would have missed it if I wasn't paying attention. And there we are, it's biting me. So with the Laguerre, you have options in regards to watching your latches go up and down and making them behave. So if you find that your needle's not on the way up when it's supposed to be, go back and start over. Or what you can do is just adjust your cam ring or your cam shell, um, like what I just did. I don't know if you saw that. So let's continue making sure all our stitches are, our latches are open. Very easy for them to hide, little sneaky guys. Just make sure that first stitch gets it, that first needle gets it, and that all of our friends, you can just push down and often the latch will open. If it's not open, we're all good. There we go. I just go a little bit slower when it comes to that first needle catching the stitch as you go by. All right. One thing I've noticed some people uh, aren't aware of when they're lifting and lowering needles is they're not necessarily lifting or lowering them to the complete height. Now, 
certainly you'll know your machine as you work with it, but there is a sweet point and there is a wall. So if you just lift it like, this is locked in the cam, so that's a bad example. But if you lift it like part way, it's kind of not all the way up and all the way down, there's a sweet spot where it's still within the, clo uh, the lower area and if you knit it, it'll be fine. But there's also that wall that if it's not the right height, when you go to come around, it's gonna hit it, the butts inside the machine. So just make sure that you have raised or lowered your needles where they want. You will know what your machine is capable of. All right. Sorry, the bumpity bump. I got the camera on my right shoulder kind of coming in from a chair. Very high tech. All right, so when you find that your heel spring isn't as tight as it should be, just adjust it. I like to pull back on my source yarn, and that's fine. It's, it's funny, whenever you're working on something, you don't hope to make a mistake on camera so that you can, you know, not have to make mistakes. But if you make a mistake, you kind of could show a learning moment. So yeah, I'm sure one will happen. We're human. It happens. Let's just see here. Nothing dropped. Beautiful. Could go faster, but there's this big camera in my way. And that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. All right, so I'm gonna basically stop there. This is designer's preference, of course. What I'm gonna do now is, now that I'm um, on the up raised needles, not doing anything bad, I'm gonna hang, hang these stitches as a hung ham up here and all the way around. So I'm gonna pause the video while I do that because it's really straightforward to do. Okay, so we started hanging the hem there. Uh, there is no weight under the machine at this moment. It's a little bit easier when you do that. Um, hanging a hem basically means taking that first stitch way down here where you started and hanging it up here all the way around. So what I've done here is I've hung from the left side of 12 all the way to pretty much what the flip time is at. That's a, uh, we'll call that uh, four, five, five o'clock. Um, I, at this point, want to make sure all the stitches are as low as possible on the needles. And what I want to do is, since I've knitted to here and it's just simply sitting in limbo over here, I want to hold down the work on the left side of 12 and just kind of knit part way across. So if you are looking at your needles, I don't know if you can see this, one of the latches are like, I want to stay up. What you can do is just very gently raise it and basically it'll stop bouncing off the fiber and it'll stay open. You can just raise that a little bit. So just make sure all of the needles have open latches. All right, so at this point, without the weight underneath, let's just see if that, no. Okay, I am pulling with my left hand gently and slowly coming across the machine. And what I'm doing here is just hanging the hem. There's gonna be a lot more tension on the machine. All the latches are open. All the double rows of, of um, stitches are, are on the bottom of each needle. Cool, so I'm just gonna advance it, perfect. Because we're almost at six, we can call that six o'clock. We're going to raise the left hand side of 12. And that way, those stitches won't dance away. They'll stay in attention. All right, we're good. And at this point, we can lower the right-hand side of 12. That way, they are able to be hung. So I'm going to continue um, hanging the hang hum here. That's a lot of words to say in a short sentence. Um, and I'm going to pause it. So let's continue going over all the way across, and then we'll come back. All right, so we finished hanging the hem all the way across. <coughs> Tricks of the trade. I've also um, put the buckle underneath and the buckle weights there are on the machine. Um, I take my nail and I like just to push down on the two layers of stitches that are hung on one needle, on each needle. And I just want to make sure that they are low enough in the slots 
so that the latch will open and the stitch will happen when the yarn comes around. So this is the tail, of course, of where it began. When you're hanging the hem here, I don't know if you've done this before, but make sure that you catch all of the stitches. So if you work your way all the way around and suddenly you find that you're short one, you can just fudge it. I won't tell anyone, you won't tell anyone. And when you finish your piece, just watch out for a loose stitch because your short one, one got missed. Um, and then you can just sew it in. No one has to know. Shh. Uh, but anyways, if you catch all of them, then you probably won't have that problem. Don't worry about it. Uh, what I like to do with my yarn tails, there's a variety of things you can do with it. You can just leave it and it might unravel. That is bad. Don't do that unless you really want to. Um, what I like to do is I'll just show you what I do. I like to... Um, go in uh, a couple needles and just e-wrap it. Uh, now that we are on the body of the piece, we are going to change to a slip stitch edge. So what we want to do is we want to do whatever kind of threading of tail not on the very first stitch because that one may not be as tight as the other stitches because there's an, a different style stitch there. So what I'm going to do here, just because I can, I'm going to wrap on the second one e-wrap don't care what direction, just gonna do it. And there, so I wrapped the, the second and third needle in from the edge. And I am just gonna hold it with my finger and then knit past. Because my weights are on, I don't need to hold the knitting. And I'm just gonna work my way over as I did before until nine o'clock. Don't be concerned about the noise. There was a lot more fiber to go through being two rows of stitches on each needle. All right, so this is where we begin now um, doing our slip stitch edge. So we're on the body and this is the very first row of the body. So every stitch that we begin with now is gonna have a raised needle. Again, I did not design this uh, technique, this technique, this part here even, is one that was reviewed with me from a an old manual from Heidi Capitos. I hope I'm saying your name right. Sorry. Um, basically, she told me that she had seen flat web knitting, and this is what it was, and raising the left stitches when you're working to 12, and that slip stitch edge is quite beautiful, and you can just do it this way. So this is how we're gonna do that. Um, I am unsure if she herself had designed the slip stitch edge, so I apologize if it was indeed Heidi, but I am, to the understanding that it's it's much older than most of us. So raising your first worked needle as you come back, before you come back, that one's raised. And what I like to do just to make sure the tail is, the tail not gonna move, is I am going to, itchy nose, uh, e-wrap on the third and now the fourth because I'm gonna have a good future with this and I don't want any problems happening. All the latches are open. So coming back, not too tight that your wrap is gonna go up the needle. There we go. And we're open down to six. And so now all you're gonna do is just repeat. At six o'clock, you're gonna raise the right side of 12. Make sure all your latches are open, sneaky guys. There, so we're gonna go to 12 and pass. We're gonna go to three, raise that first needle. Latches are open, come back. Basically at six, kind of overshot it. Shh, don't tell anyone. Lower our latches, or rather open our latches. And if I was very retentive, I uh, wrap one more row of two e wrap and then I can snip it once I go by. Ain't no chance this guy's gonna come undone. All right, here we go. Beautiful. All right, what we're gonna do now is take care of that tail. I love and have all the patience for knitting, not so much for sewing. It's kind of funny, probably, but. If you can take care of it now, why not? All right, so from now on, we're going to always raise the first work needle, keep our latches open, 
go to six. Stop. Lift the needles on the other side that we just took care of. So I'm going to do a couple rows and then we'll put it on pause and finish. So essential things here, we always lift the opposite side of 12. We come across so that we don't accidentally knit the opposite shore. When we come back, we raise that first needle. We have that beautiful edge you saw in my demo piece. Lift your needles with whatever works for you. I like to hold my pick tool in my hand. My current pick tool is actually a leather awl from eBay. It's nice and light. It's hand shaped. And all I did was bend the end. It was like $1.50. I'm not saying that the other ones out there aren't any better. It just, I don't know, it just fits nice in my hand. Um, so whatever works for you. There's so many beautiful things out there. So raising. All right, so you probably can't see it, but I can see here that it's dropped a stitch. The good news is, is it's not traveled yet because I haven't pulled on it. So let's see, can I zoom in? I don't know if this works as well as I'd like. Autofocus. Yeah, no, okay. So just trust me, <laughs> I've dropped a stitch. Uh, the bar is just beneath the needle and I'm trapping the needle that's below it or the stitch that's below it and I'm just going to lift both onto the the needle. So given that it's a bit far away I apologize. Now we have the bar that just didn't knit and the previous stitch on the needle. I'm going to take my pick tool and catch the previous row stitch underneath and pick it up and over, up and over. A little bit harder when you have two layers of fabric and two types of yarn. All right, so now that stitch has been knitted, so I don't have to worry about that. Catching stuff as you go is a little bit easier, but you can always sew it in afterwards if you really make a boo-boo. All right, so we're gonna continue here. So this is the basic pattern until you get your hung hem. So the question is, how long do I work this? Um, you can't make it too long and you certainly can make it too short. So too short would mean that when it's no longer on the machine, it shrinks up because there's no weight on it and there's nowhere to put your weights underneath when you're using it as a cast on bonnet. So as I reviewed in the beginning there, I like to make the piece with the weight on it uh, below my crank wheel. A couple fingers, whatever works for you. That way, when you're absolutely done done, there's still a lot of room and much to work with. So what's happened here is it didn't knit this last stitch. The latch is closed, little goober. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to catch that stitch that's dancing in the wind down here Oof, there's two of them because of course there's two yarns always harder when there's a video going and because this is a slip stitch edge it's extra fancy so what we got to do here uh, da, 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 da. I think it actually catches this one here so it's not as obvious if you don't drop every single needle, every single stitch, you could probably get away with doing this. But if you drop every single one, maybe it's time to start over. So what I did there is I picked up the drop stitch and I picked up the neighbor. And I'm gonna try to do from the back of the machine on camera is just bring that first drop stitch over the picked up stitch. Not a lot you can see there. Really, you can't go wrong. Don't worry about it. 
long as there's some stitching done. And my live yarn, I'm making one more stitch. Kind of fudging it on camera. You didn't see it, what? And that's what it takes, you do what it takes. Oh, it's misbehaving. Ah, la la la. There we go. Ooh, tight. All right, so we're gonna raise that first stitch. Here we are. Make sure your latches are open. Here we go. choose to use two yarns at once which I have done does make a bit of a bouncier fabric and so the latch won't always behave so you are uphill battle but be stubborn you can do it there we are we're happy all right Couple more rows and then I'm gonna pause it. It's very straightforward. I don't really worry about whether the latch is closing when I lift them. Some people say it's better that you have them open when they go up and then they'll be open when they go down. But they will do what they want sometimes. So don't, don't stress. Just try to knit what you can knit. So I'm going to pause the video now and work the material until it's just below the crank wheel. All right, so I'm checking back in with you here. Um, I have knitted the material on my machine to the approximate length of the crank wheel. Um, I had the weight on a moment ago and with that weight on it and the way it sits it was pretty much at the crank wheel but taking off the weights of course you can see that it is a little bit longer than I possibly wanted to make it but that is fine. Um, one of my tricks also for a quick measure of how long I want it to be in trying to make them all the same is I use a pencil. So you can just pretty much put the pencil under the machine and if your knitted work is about the length you want it to be, there you are done. Really not that complex. Put that pencil up later. <laughs> All right, so I've taken the weight off the machine, the buckle sitting there as you saw. Uh, next step is to do the Pico Edge, the split ring hang. Um, I have previously posted a segment on how to do just that, if that's all you want to do at this point before 
any other project, etc. But at this point, we're going to review that again. Just because why would I send you elsewhere when I have you right here? Anyways. All right, so here we go. What you want to do is um, have finished your row. You want to make sure that you're not mid-row. Uh, you're not like over here and you still have more, more to knit before you start doing stuff because it'll make it uneven if that matters to you. <laughs> it matters to you. Um, it doesn't matter if you are hanging from the right or hanging from the left because when you're working flat, you work from both sides. But basically, take the weight off the machine and now we do stitch transferring. So the basic premise with my Easy Transfer Pico Edge is to, here's that first needle, a right of 12. I will pick up that stitch, I will drop a split ring on the needle, and I'll replace that stitch. And then on its neighbor, I'll pick the neighbor stitch up and put it on top, leaving a ring and two stitches. And then what I'll do is I'll flip the ring over the needle and tuck it inside. Now, why do I do that? Well, that does a couple things at once there. Um, a, it's very easy. Uh, B, less chance that you're going to split your yarn or break your yarn with moving all the stitches all over the place. And pretty much C, well, it's just easier. You'll see. Um, some people will do each step in its entirety. What I like to do is I do them all um, to a point, and then I'll do the next step, kind of like assembly line working. So I don't know if you can see it from here, but I'll do a couple, the pause the video, and then do the rest of the row. So pick the stitch up, drop the needle, or rather the ring on the needle, snug up that stitch because it wants to get all loose if you're pulling on it. Gently pick up the neighbor stitch, put it on that first needle. So now I have ring and two stitches. To finish this whole process, I would then just kind of push down on the needle, flip it, or rather the ring, flip it over, and just tuck it. Now that would be uh, ready for uh, the next stitch, or rather to knit, if I had a bunch of them done. So why do we tuck them? We tuck them on the inside of the cylinder, just for this row that we would do thereafter, so nothing gets um, caught or trapped or whatever. So at this point, what I'm going to continue to do is just do part of it in process, and then do the other part. Um, I'll do a couple more while you're watching. So what I'm trying to say is this, now it's the third needle. I will prepare it by temporarily lifting the stitch, dropping a split ring on it. Get there, there we are. Replacing that original stitch, its neighbor to the right. I am lifting up and putting it on that third needle. Now, see, what I'm going to do, what I was trying to say is my assembly line working, which I feel is faster, is I haven't flipped it over the needle yet. I'm going to continue going on and doing that over here, and then I'll flip it over and tuck. Um, you'll probably want to get to about here, and then we'll do the next step, okay? So what you want to do then, again, to confirm, is you want to continue on doing this method of hanging a split ring and doing your pico. I'll do one final one before I pause the video. So we are on, what is that, needle number one, two, three, four, five. Needle five, which has a stitch on it. We're gonna lift the stitch, put the ring, replace the stitch, get the neighbor, hello neighbor. And we're gonna put neighbor on it, the one beside it. So again, I have two rings not flipped over and tucked. Uh, we're going to go all the way over, and then I will come back to you. All right, so let's do that. All right, we're back here. As you can see, I have hung split rings and done a pico all the way over to about 7 o'clock. So the next step then, because these are only half the step of this procedure, is to take the ring that's sitting on the outside flip it over the needle so then you just do that and whether you do it all in one step or whether you do it as i have and just assembly line it whatever works for you so before we can do any row knitting after the hang a pico we need that these rings are hung and tucked after flipping them over 
So we're going to do that all the way around. Up and over. If you rest your finger on your machine, you might have a little more control. We call that in dentistry fulcruming. Just gives you like a pivot. And of course, I am going fairly quickly, but it does have a bit of a rhythm once you have everything right there. So as you can see, I've done all the way over to here. They're not quite tucked yet. I will make sure they're down, but they are certainly flipped. It gets a bit difficult when you're working in front of you because you no longer have the angulation. There's really no wrong way of doing this unless you're breaking stitches or it's just incredibly difficult. It all comes with time. A good pick tool works perfect. Makes it a little easier. Um, I also have some extra kind of pick tools that can hold stitches if they immediately drop. Because the first thing you want to do is make sure they don't run further. But I shouldn't have said that. I'll jinx myself and I'll drop a bunch of stitches. It happens to all of us. Don't let your machine frustrate you. Take it a couple steps at a time or even just one or half a step at a time. Whatever gets you where you need to go. Don't overwhelm yourself. It's, that's very easy to happen. So all the rings that I've applied thus far are now flipped over. And now what I want to do is I just want to tuck them inside, just kind of level to the cylinder. You may not be able to see I'm using a new video program on my iPhone. It allows me to pause, which kind of helps. The combined video is already going to be much less for time for you than the original attempt, which got deleted by accident. New software means new learning, and I didn't learn it before I screwed up. All right, here we go. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Now, technically, I could probably stop about here if they're all tucked and then uh, proceed with the crank but if I'm gonna do this many I might as well make sure they're all in so there is no weight on the machine right now to confirm that um, just because it would make that you're pulling against the fiber and it's a lot more work to pull against the tension of it uh, I'm currently just taking the pick tool and just grabbing the lower part of the metal ring on the inside of the cylinder just to help it tuck inside Great, all the way over. That happened actually pretty quick. All right, so, and then of course I'll flip them back up. Um, what you'll wanna do is just make sure all your latches are of course open. This row right after the split ring application Pico is a bit of tension, uh, has a bit of tension, a bit more tension than usual. Um, now that we are on the hung ham, we will switch back to the regular edge stitch so we are no longer going to be doing the short row uh, edge to make it beautiful because we want something that is robust on the, the corner versus something that looks beautiful. Not that the other one isn't robust, but you, you'll see in a minute. All right, so we're ready here to proceed. We never move the crank unless we have some weight on the inside of the machine or on the work. So what I'm going to do here is with my left hand, I'm going to temporarily just to advance advance the uh, crank and the yarn carrier. I'm just going to make sure by pushing down with my finger, you can't be too careful here. You know, you don't want to drop stuff and then have to fix it. It's way more work. All right, so we are ready to come back around. So holding down, I'm just going to slowly advance and make sure I catch that first stitch. Now here's the trick. Anything that doesn't have a ring on it is just kind of have the, has the yarn fed into it. Now, if you didn't have enough tension, and this is just fairly light tension, then what happens sometimes, and keep an eye for it, is the unhung needles, the ones that are just empty currently, sometimes the yarn will be like, hey, you know what, nothing's keeping me here, and it just flips over. So before you finish this row, be sure to check any bits of fiber that might have flipped up on over. So I'm looking here and I can see none had flipped and you'll know they'll flip because there'll be a bar there or something. 
And of course, it's not doing anything I warn you against or for when I'm watching and warning you for it. Anyway, so as you can see, we've knitted all the way over. Uh, we are technically thereabouts at six. So what happens at six stays at six. So basically, let's do our, our needle transfers or raising and lowering. So at six o'clock, we will secure those started needles or rather those hung stitches and hung rings just by lifting, oops, sorry, lifting the uh, the needles on the right of 12. All right, good. So there we go. So what happens now? Uh, well, now we put split rings on the end. So I'm gonna pause you real quick and do that. All right, so I have hung all of the split rings except for the very last one because there's a bit of a technique to it. And I thought I'd just show you real quick. Um, so the very last one, of course, has two stitches on that last needle. Or not really two stitches per se, it's that it's a, it has that slip stitch edge. And it's a bit thicker than one stitch sitting there. So just be careful when you are transferring it to its neighbor for that last Pico prep. So what you can do is just simply do one at a time whatever works for you. But do note that it's more than just one set of stitches there. It's the previous row and that one. So just gently coax that little guy and there you are. Because again, it has that thicker line of uh, short row um, edges here. So that one of course had more stitches or more fiber on that last ring. All right, so now I have hung all of our split rings. They're all tucked, they're all flipped and tucked, and there. So now that everything is where it should be, and I'm still at six o'clock, I'm going to put my weights back on the machine. That way I have my hands, which is always nice to have for full access to do anything. Weight is hung, I'm gonna coax anything that might be raised up on the inside. Check that all my latches are open. Always do that. And I'm just going to check with my carrier having gone in reverse there. It got behind where it needed to be. Check that it is where it will catch the stitches. Oh, I can't go on that side. Uh, I think we're good. All right, so. What I still like to do because we're doing this initial row, so just gently hang on with my left hand to kind of just coax the unhung fiber to stay on that, that stitch. All right, so you, you know I warned you that just be careful and be mindful of anything that doesn't have a split ring on it might flip over and none of it has flipped, of course. So basically when you do your own, you'll see here, of course, this is the split ring here. And here is just a regular stitch that's just started after. So that fiber, that single stitch there is often the one all the way between the rings that can flip over. Anyways, super easy, that part's done. We are now on the hung hem of this project. So continuing with regular edges. So what is a regular edge? A regular edge does not mean lifting that first needle anymore. But because right now the stitch is has gone ahead of the ring as it, or rather ahead of the needle as it normally would. Just because this one here, if we come back, it won't necessarily knit as good. Um, sometimes it will definitely catch it and go under the latch and then around the latch and cause a stitch, which is great. But let's just make sure it will make a stitch here. So what I'm doing is I took the leading edge of the yarn and I flipped it from the front of the stitch to the back of the stitch. So now we're gonna start our First row after, or I guess it's technically the second row, after the split ring pico. And everything's happy, latches open. Beautiful, stopping at six. We continue swapping our needles uh, at the 12 o'clock position there. All latches are open, continue. And continue with the regular edge, not the slip stitch edge. There we go. And you'll probably want to do that for another eight rows, five to eight rows, and then end with your scrap yarn. 
I should have left for work now. I probably should do this really quickly if I'm gonna do it. All right, this actually goes pretty quick. If you boober and accidentally leave a needle down, it's gonna knit over here as it did. Don't worry about that, just fix it. And come on back. This part actually goes pretty quick. When you do what you're supposed to do, there you go. So it's really personal preference how many uh, whoops rows you do after that part there. So certainly you can just do what you prefer. I've dropped a stitch here, I'll fix it in a minute. So basically end your project at the 12. You will not stop at six, you'll continue all the way over here or maybe over here, depending on what direction you're going in and switch to your scrap. I will show that in the next video, but I should probably go to work. Uh, well, maybe I'll just keep going. Nobody saw me do that. Okay, wait. So I'm just going to raise these here. As I said, I did drop a stitch here, of course. Um, there is a total of three rows that need a little bit of help here. So what I've done is I've hung all three on the um, needle there. And the most recent pass is I've just taken it off. And then I have the original and the one after. Basically by layering them, I can put the very bottom over the second one, if that makes any sense. There we're knitted. And then the most recent one, put it on top. And then knit that stitch. Of course, there's a bit more fiber there than they should be. But you can just wiggle it through. There, never happened. What? All right, so we're going to the left. Patches are open. I'll just switch to my scrap. All right, so this is where you switch to scrap, but make sure you leave enough of your good yarn to do your uh, closure of the live stitches. So I just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Always better to have too much than too little. I'm gonna cut it here. It's on the heel spring, so it'll zip up out of eyeball sight. I'm gonna take the fiber off the machine. There you are, off the machine. Tangled out of sight, la la la. Okay, and I'll take the second yarn off the machine. Get my scrap off the floor where it's sitting conveniently and then thread it in the machine here. I have said before that I really do prefer the little clamps 3.5 inch hemostats. Um, this particular one's from Amazon. Get a good quality one. They break easy otherwise. Um, this one, they call it a fishing one. just because they tie off those fishing lures, fly lures, whatever they're called. Um, all right. Uh, use whatever works for you. I clamp it so I don't have to tie knots that I have to undo later. Good. And what I'm going to do is, of course, engage the heel spring in a minute you're still going back and forth you could end at this point going in the round but why there we are heel spring engaged everything is snug which is why it's good to have a clip all right we're good latches open if you go a speed demon and you can power to you but i don't go speed demon especially when i'm showing stuff because things drop and then i have more work i don't want more work so as you can see, sometimes it's catching, or rather not quite catching where you want it. So just rewind and come back. That was that first needle coming back. Wasn't at the right height to grab the stitch, so I just kept rewinding and coming back with the crank until it was at the right height. I don't know if that made sense. Uh, we can review that in a later day and time if you need. So here we go, raising. I like to do at least, you know, like eight rows. If you drop a stitch during your scrap, just hang it. Don't worry about fixing it. It is scrap. 
As long as it's holding your live stitches of your work, you're good. So it may be worth just getting some callus on your fingers here. When you're doing this, there is a technique that I'm using that I'm not demonstrating very easily or quickly. When I'm pushing up on these very sharp needles, I'm actually not pushing on the point of the hook. I'm under the hook. So I'm pushing with tension more than I am with raising with the hook. So there's no stabby stabby there. So we are done now. I'll come all the way over at six o'clock, do your transfers. We are now done this project. So if you wanted to, of course, you could continue with the same project, make another one. You could cut your scrap and just crank until it falls off. Hang on to it though, so your weight doesn't hit the floor. Uh, you're pretty much it. So um, what this looks like to finish is, oh, this cat here, sorry, Ooh. is that uh, this looks like this. I'm using two fibers at once, which gives you that variegated look. That's your hung hem on the bottom that we started with. And then there's our split rings and our pico stitch with cat hair, sorry. And there's your scrap. So it was really nice uh, demoing this for you today. Uh, I hope this is helpful. Please feel free to visit me on Instagram. Uh, my nickname is Karen Leanne Ramel. That's Karen, K A R E N Ramel. Sorry, Karen Leanne, L E A N N E, Ramel, R A M E L. And that's my nickname. Um, and that's pretty much it. Any other information you might need, uh, please message me in the comments, send me an email, whatever works. Anything that might be pertinent, I will leave in the information part of this video. All right, happy trails and CSM love to you all.